In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Devotion to Christ, Anglican Spirituality, a Tradition for Today. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Matthew Hoskin, Professor of Christian History at Davenant Hall. As always, I am joined by my brother. I am uh, Archdeacon Jonathan Hoskin. I'm Archdeacon of Brandon um, in the Diocese of Brandon in the Anglican Church of Canada. I am parish priest for uh, St. George's Anglican Church in Brandon with St. Luke's Anglican Church in Souris, Manitoba. And we are excited to be moving along with the Lord's Prayer in this episode, something we had begun previously. And we're going to go previously where we were just talking, as you hopefully recall, being dev devoted listeners to our pod. Uh, you will remember that we were talking about the Lord's Prayer and its place in the liturgy and its place in the history of the church and why, why you should read it and pray it um, and, and all of these things. So I'm going to just read one um, sort of big last quote from St. Maximus, the confessor's work on the ecclesiastical mystagogy which is a theological vision of the liturgy where he talks about sort of the symbolism and allegory of the actions that you do um, at in the Byzantine liturgy of the seventh century. And he says, um, and so we're looking at what is the symbolism of the holy prayer, the Our Father, and St. Maximus says, the all holy and revered invocation of our great and blessed God the Father is a symbol of the subsistent and imminent adoption which will be given according to the gift and grace of the Holy Spirit. When this adoption occurs, every human particularity will be overcome and concealed, and all the saints will be called and will be sons of God by the grace that has come upon them. As many as wash themselves brightly and gloriously from then on in the divine beauty of goodness through the virtues. So they're talking generally about the Lord's Prayer, but really just about the words our father our father yeah yeah <clears throat> well and there's there's something to be said about that because because father doesn't mean the same thing to everybody uh certainly in this world when we talk about our fathers it conjures up different uh impressions different memories um of fathers that people have had <clears throat> but in this instance, we're talking about our father. Now, even though we're only, we're only, you know, uh, spoiler alert, right? The next line is, who art in heaven. Um, so we're not talking about our fathers on earth. Um, we're not addressing our dads. Um, we are addressing our father who art in heaven. Uh, but we'll get to that part later. Um, and, and I guess there are a couple of ways that, that we apply father when we talk about God in heaven, aren't there? Uh, we, sometimes when we say that God is our father, we mean God is creator of all things in, in sort of in a general sense, God is my father by virtue of creation. Um, as God is the father of all things that exist, uh, the rock, the tree, um, the dog, the cat. And I, and that's not what Jesus is getting at, right? Like, like we have to remember, these are words Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. And so when Jesus, I mean, here's, Here's a grace in these words, right? When Jesus says you should pray like this, our father, <clears throat> there's a sense in which Jesus is himself praying these words as he's teaching his disciples to pray using these words and lumping himself with them, with us who come after and pray using these words. Sorry, I need to clear my throat. I'll give you a second to say some more, brother. Well, and and that ties into the, the Maximus quote that I read at the beginning here, that Maximus' heavy emphasis is on the fact that we are adopted 
sons of God, and that this is an act of God's grace unto us. And so that that is, and so for the Christian, that is the way that I think when we talk about God as our father, one of the primary things that we should be thinking about in his book, Knowing God, um, Anglican theologian J.I. Packer talks about how um, we have a, in the churches of the Reformation, we have a strong emphasis a lot of the time talking about justification and what does that mean and how do you go about that? And he talks about that's an important necessary doctrine. How do you enter into a right relationship with God? But our adoption as God's children is actually higher. That that is something even better because that is like we are being lifted up to the heavens. We are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God word, the second person of the Trinity, co-eternal with the Father, has chosen the humans who are baptized and regenerated in his name to rule the universe with him at some point, right? That is not necessarily the first thing you're going to think about, but it's, it's a realization that we are, he is our father and he has chosen us and we have been adopted into the family and kingdom of God. Um, and that, and I think that is what really in my mind, uh, we're looking at here. He is God, our father, specifically in this Jesus says our father. So his father and the father of the disciples, um, not in the more general broad way, such as the brotherhood of all mankind kind of way. So like the line in joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Thou our father, Christ, our brother, all who live in love are thine, right? Which ties us into first John quite strongly. Right, right. Ties us, ties us into that. <clears throat> that that bond of being the family of god uh i think well and in so much that um to borrow a term from um from someone <laughs> from scott hahn uh i mean that this is a high calling is to be the children of God and to be called the children of God. And that's really what we are. We're not just being called that we really are the children of God. This is, this is scripture, right? Um, but, but, uh, but that high calling um, is really makes this, the, our father makes that our, that possessive, um, the hour of power right? Uh, yes. This is this is the great, great, incredible thing. Uh, it is the hour of power. It, it transforms who we are. It transforms our relationship to God. And I think somehow in my mind, when it's the Our Father, this is not coming from any of the church fathers, although maybe it is uh, somewhere subliminally in me, um, it feels more intimate than other ways of addressing God, that he's not, that obviously he is, of course, the great high and mighty king of kings, lord of lords, the only judge of princes, um, who sits high and lofty on his throne, who is throned um, by the cherubim and worshipped by the seraphim and thrice holy cry and all these things. And these things are all absolutely true. Um, and that that is who the father is. And when we say our father, you also drawing in this, just as the cherubim and the seraphim are there, so also are we in the throne room of God and are, in fact, coming to his footstool. And that he, as our father, is going to listen to us, right? Um, sometimes we want to make uh, it seem like he's a big, comfy daddy of some kind. Mm. And maybe sometimes that's God's approach to us. But maybe sometimes he is not quite that much, but he's still, I would say... The, in terms of God as father, his character as um, the divine father towards his adopted children is one of loving care and attention and openness to us, because that is the vision of the father that Jesus gives us in his parables, most especially the parable of the prodigal son, that the father goes out every day looking for the lost son and welcomes him with open arms when he comes back. So when we come and say, our father, we're not I mean, we are talking to the one who is um, the most glorious, most high, but also he is one who loves us and comes down to us and is ready to hear everything that we have to say, that we have that intimacy with our father. 
that we either, we'd like to imagine and hope that Prince William has with the king or something like that, you know? Right, right. And, well, and that, right, and that's that being the heir, right? And we've been made co-heirs with Jesus. Um, and and so that that speaks of that kind of kind of intimacy uh, in in relationship um, that we are co-heirs with Jesus. Uh, and and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, yeah, I you know, I I'll tell you, though, I've, I've been thinking about about these first couple of words of the Lord's Prayer. And and we were talking to people last time we were together about, about how um, praying the Lord's Prayer in the words that Jesus taught uh, has can have such a formative influence in the lives of Christians. Um, and, and it has since the beginning. I mean, there, there were, uh, I mean, since the start, Christian uh, church fathers and doctors of the church and so on have have written extensively their reflections on the Lord's Prayer, on the words of the Lord's Prayer, um, because it's been a part of Christian worship since the beginning, that they would pray these words that, that Jesus, well, as you said, as you've pointed out to us in the Didache, um, and you just read to us from Maximus the Confessor, uh, and and uh, and these are not, you know, the two isolated instances of the Lord's Prayer being referenced, right? Like it's all over the place, in in uh, since since the very beginning in the church, and um, and I think one of the things that strikes me and and uh, Tertullian was was a uh, uh, you know, he was where we've been um, focusing with these two words on on the the relationship that calling God our Father uh, points us to. Um, his Tertullian's big thing was was um, we don't say my Father. It's it's in Jesus Christ that we are able to call God Father. And so we don't call him my Father, we call him our Father, because at least we're praying with Jesus when we say these words. I would go further and say that, uh, I mean, I would go all the way and say that all the saints who have ever prayed these words, we're joining our voices with them as we pray. All the ones who have gone before us, all the people who have put their trust in God, that Together, we are collectively saying, our Father. Uh, it's not just me and the people who are praying with me at this particular moment, or me and the people in the room or in the same city as me, uh, who who uh, would call themselves Christians and who God has welcomed into this adopted relationship with him. But it's, it's you know, transcendent of time that we god's people who who through the blood of jesus have been redeemed and made his own uh, through through re receiving his body and blood uh have been remade and recreated we've become the new creation uh the people of god um his children uh not not just by virtue of of you know god made everything but by virtue of god has chosen us god has looked upon us and said this is something precious to me and and uh and of such value to me and and i call it my own my son my daughter um And the way that making this a part of our regular prayer shapes the way that we think, the way that we understand the world, the way that we understand the universe, the way that everything works, the, our relationship to God, our relationship to other people, 
um, what it means to really love other people uh, as as Christ has loved us um, begins with joining our voices with the saints who have gone before us and calling God not not my father. What a presumptuous thing for me to say, but calling addressing God as my father. It's a beautiful thing he invites us to do. I might have a few more reflections, but I'll, I'll let you okay. go if you've got more to say. Um, well, I think it, it is a beautiful thing. And it's, and that's why, you know, Jesus elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount says, when you pray, as Matthew 6, 6, go into your secret place and shut the door. Your heavenly father hears your voice and will reward. And then he tells us to pray our father, right? And so you're alone and you're still saying our father because when you're, you're never actually alone, right? The Christian alone is never alone. Um, you are united with Christ and through Christ to all of the saints throughout all generations. Um, and so that's one of the great and glorious things about when you pray the Lord's Prayer is this. Um, it's like a moment of eternity cutting through time mm -hmm. that because we are united with Christ in eternity and we have God, the eternal one, as father, we are bound to all Christians who are here now who have gone before and who will go, who will come after us when we say our father, which is, yeah, like you were saying, that's actually a great, glorious, beautiful thing. Um, and just related to some of what we've been saying as well, one of the things that's the main point that St. Cyril of Jerusalem makes here in his catechetical lectures, which is a series of lectures he's giving to people who are going to be baptized. And so he mostly he's going through what, what's going to happen at the baptism and what happens at church. And well, one of the things you do is you have to know the Lord's prayer. And so you're going to have to pray the Lord's Prayer while you're at church, and here's what it means. But the big thing he says is that we are in rebellion against God, basically. We are sinners, and yet he, in his great grace, right? Maximus also talked about the grace of God in this prayer as well, um, chooses to have us call him Father. Um, and so that's just it. It's not just like, it's not just like, I'm a good guy. I could have been worthy. Right? We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under God's table. Yet he has chosen to adopt us. We who are worthy of death have been given life, and not just life, but life abundantly as sons and daughters of the one true and living God. And that is great and glorious and beautiful. And in virtue of that, we are able to join with the throngs of angels and all of the saints in heaven and uh, praise and magnify his name and entreat him with the words of the our father um which is yeah i think a wonderful thing um to be able to think on and to be able to meditate on something like that when you pray the lord's prayer transforms the prayer and i like resources like that um for your devotional life because if you've spent a long time anglican you've done these prayers so many times right and how do you keep how do you keep it so you're still praying in your heart and not just with your lips? That so you're not just blitzing through the prayers. Well, meditate on them with the reflections of the fathers or the theologians, with um whoever, um, on what these little words mean as you go along, um, so you can be drawn further up and further in. Mm -hmm. I would yeah, I I mean that particular reflection, um I'm just thinking about how how um what what that familial relationship does to to the security of of our place with God um because my kids can be really rebellious sometimes you know which just means they don't go to bed when they're sent or whatever right I mean they're they're kids just little kids um but but even in open rebellion against me, they are still mine. Um, and I and I won't disown them. 
I was thinking too, though, um, I was thinking, you know, I, I've found a, a strong challenge when I was, when I finished my second year of seminary, uh, and I, I went to, um, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, for a summer internship, um, with Father Earl Burke, uh, who, who retired at the end of the summer, um, That's how hard I was on him. Um, but <laughs> Absolutely. He, uh, no, on my first Sunday there, he announced his retirement. It didn't. It didn't sort One of. One look at you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. One look at me. Yeah. Um, but, but I was challenged that summer. Um, the it was a congreg two congregations full of people, who when we prayed the Lord's prayer somehow they sounded like they meant it they sounded like the petitions like they they meant them they wanted his kingdom to come and his will to be done um and and somehow the inflection and the way they turned their phrases um challenged me because it sounded like they really meant it and i don't know that that had been a super common experience for me prior to then that I, that in hearing others praying the Lord's prayer um, that they sounded like they really meant it. And uh, it was the weirdest experience for me, but, but a big challenge that do not let yourself fall into rote repetition of these words um, because they are meaningful. They, they matter. And, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's changing me, right? It, it, the Lord is changing me through praying the words that he taught. Um, so don't, don't give up on, on, on praying his words. Um, and I, I mean, I remember sometimes, um, Father Earl and I would would be praying morning prayer uh, from the prayer book, and we'd get sometimes we'd get as far as um, the Benedictus, sometimes the Te Deum, and sometimes only the Venite, and and he would stop there and just sit in silent meditation on the words of the Psalm of the Canticle. Um, and after 10, 15 minutes, that was the end of morning prayer. We hadn't completed the prayer office, but we had spent time in prayer that morning, um, in communing with God. And that's sort of the point. And, and that's Jesus's point in teaching his disciples to pray these words is, is we're being drawn into a new life through a new relationship with God. And when we call him father, we call him father as his adopted children, as members of the family, as co-heirs with Jesus. Um, Jesus is maybe the only one who, who could have prayed my father, um, because Jesus is son of the father in a unique way. He's the only begotten son. Um, and yet, even, even with that advantage, he teaches us to pray our Father. Um, he prays those words along with us. And uh, this is God's grace. This is God's grace to us. Amen. Thank you, Father Jonathan. Before we close, just a reminder that we are soliciting topics, questions, ideas. Um, so get in touch with us. A lot of you know one or both of us, and so you can get in touch with one or both of us with your idea. Um, comment if you're on the YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel, or no one has yet to comment on the Libsyn page. So I don't know if anyone actually goes to that. Uh, 
it lists numbers of downloads, but I don't know if any of those are from that or if they're all from like Spotify or something. Anyway, but hey, if you have a way of getting in touch with us, get in touch with us and uh, see. And we would love to hear from you what things about spirituality, Anglican spirituality in particular, uh, you would be interested in hearing us talk about. Mm -hmm. And we would be interested in sort of joining you in the journey, be a bit more interactive in that way. Well, even even your own thoughts. We've just been talking yes. about the words "Our Father" at the start of the Lord's Prayer. What what are your thoughts? How how have those words struck you over your years? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Let yeah. us. Know. And at the bare minimum, as every podcast and YouTuber likes to remind the audience, please like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. So now, as is our custom. Father Jonathan can close with the Collect for Trinity 23, I believe. O God, our refuge and strength, who art the author of all godliness, be ready, we beseech thee, to hear the devout prayers of thy church. Grant that those things which we ask faithfully, we may obtain effectually. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs>